Welcome to Nonprofit Executive Spotlight, an occasional series sponsored by Rogue Tulips Consulting, where we feature nonprofit professionals seeking their next opportunity. I'm Cecilia Sepp, I'm your host, and I'm the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips Consulting. This week, we are featuring Anuja Minor, who has a strong background in membership engagement and leadership development. Welcome, Anuja. Please tell our audience something about yourself and say hello. Well, hello. Um, thank you so much, Cecilia, for having me today and uh, you know, for uh, giving uh, individuals an opportunity to be on this platform to kind of talk about themselves. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, my background is uh, member engagement. I've uh, worked with boards. I've worked with uh, committees. And, you know, I do really, really enjoy the association world. It's just a very unique um, set of individuals that you work with, but it's also a very close-knit um, family, I'd like to call it, versus instead of, you know, that corporate structure. So uh, I'm just really thrilled to be here today. Oh, well, that's great. And I know we've known each other for uh, several years now, and I've always been really impressed with your background and your knowledge and your ability to work with people. Well, but let's you. talk. A, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the last few years, though. A lot of people since the lockdown, they had to deal with uh, changing jobs uh, by choice or not by choice. Some people have had layoffs. Uh, some people's positions were eliminated for whatever reason. Uh, it's not always a layoff because, you know, to me, a layoff as well. We're just getting rid of everybody for money. Uh, but, you know, sometimes positions are just eliminated because there's a restructuring and, and it's not really a layoff. Uh, sometimes jobs aren't the right fit. So you are one of the original members of the Fridays at Force Society, which was a group that started to help people that were looking for jobs in those early days of the lockdown. So what were some of the lessons that you learned from going through this experience the last few years? Well, you know, I think that one of the lessons I've learned is, you know, change is going to happen. And, you know, it's it's how what you do with that change. It's you look at you have to look at it as an opportunity. So, yes, I've been, you know, one of those individuals impacted and you we hear every day, you know, people being laid off in large corporations and the association world also has gone through gradual changes over the last few years because they're a membership organization, but it's being able to pivot and um, and using your network um, to to discuss you know the, the issues that you're going through, or losing a job, or talking to people about being laid off, or for whatever reason, is never easy. But sharing that with others is really really important because it puts you in a positive mind frame. It you get to hear stories from other people that are also going through similar experiences. It's like you you tell one person, and a lot of times two or three people will talk about what they've experienced, right? And so one of the things I've done is, you know, did a lot of LinkedIn learning. Um, uh, I networked with a lot of people, did a lot of cold calling with people just to connect, not necessarily looking for jobs, but I think just learning more about, you know, what is it others are experiencing and what are some of the takeaways for me? And Fridays at Four was certainly one of those groups that I joined early on. Uh, and I think I might've been one of their first members. And, you know, my network of link folks on LinkedIn uh, prior to the pandemic was, I think, 200 since the pandemic. And subsequently after that, it's uh, almost 600. That just goes to show you the power of people and that you have to really, really take the time to go through that, you know, the grief process or, you know, accept the fact that this has happened, but being able to transform that into much more of a positive experience. So did you find that you thought about resilience and did you take steps to build your own resilience? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I had a difficult time, you know, in 2020, like a lot of other people for a number of reasons, and then losing a job in that time frame and not being able to see people um, was really, really hard and not being able, and the only way you could connect is, is through Zoom, but having that connection in person. Uh, I think we all built resilience even when the pandemic hit March 16th. Um, but then after that, you know, losing your job during that time frame, 
you have two choices, right? You can give up or or build your resilience that you don't think that you actually have, but we are all built in such a way that we actually are able to get through really anything. It's just believing in yourself to say, you know what? Yes, this happened, but you know, the person looking at you in the mirror, talking back to you, the only person really that that has to believe in you, right? And so even though others can be there to give you support, it's sometimes you have to rely on yourself to be able to pull yourself by the bootstrap and say, you know what, take that first step. You know, I, I love that. I think uh, that you're absolutely right. Uh, you have to reach out to people, build those connections, and your opinion of yourself is really the only one that matters. So uh, kudos to you for acknowledging that and knowing it and moving forward with that. So let's talk about some of those lessons then. When you and I were getting ready for this discussion, you would also mention the fear factor. So how did you see, maybe not in yourself, but in other people, how did that fear factor seem to affect their ability to deal with the constantly shifting professional environment? And then how could you, how did you, I should say, how did you help other people manage their fear? Let me answer that question by sharing a quote with you from Eleanor Roosevelt. And she basically said, do one thing every day that scares you. And, you know, fear is something that we all go through, fear of change, fear of, you know, failure. Uh, And I think the only person that you have to be fearful of, as I mentioned earlier, is the person looking at you in the mirror. We're all fearful of, you know, what are, how are people going to react? Oh, I'm embarrassed about this, or I'm embarrassed about that. I'm embarrassed that happened to me. But I think that you will find, um, and one of the things I learned is that others have gone through similar things, if not worse things. And so by taking that first step of sharing um, the fact that, hey, I've lost my job or, you know, this is what happened to me, it, you will really realize how much strength you're actually displaying. And in that helps others also kind of, you know, share their thoughts and their fears with others as well. And I think that's one of the first things I learned through the pandemic is that people are willing people will judge you whether you do the right thing and people will judge you whether you do the wrong thing. And so, you know, why worry about what other people think about you? Because at the end of the day, they're not with you every single day to experience what you're dealing with. So I think fear is something that I've learned to overcome it by just doing things and being my own, you know, genuine self. Well, that, I love that. That's a great attitude. And So somebody like yourself who's just gone through another period of uh, self-assessment and challenges and figuring out that, yes, I can handle anything. So how does that translate into your next professional opportunity? Well, one of the things I started doing is just, you know, doing daily affirmations of, you know, focusing on my skill set, but also taking a look at you know, are there things I could have done differently in, in my role, previous roles? And I think alert, taking those lessons and figuring out, okay, I could have done this differently. And it's like, I, I love sports and my sports analogy is that Monday morning quarterbacking, right? Yes. You can <laughs> figure out, oh, you should have done this play, but you know, what happened yesterday, it's done. You can't replay it. It's not a TV show. You can't go back and, you know, rewatch it. You can't rewind it. And then focusing on today, you know, what could you do differently today? But more importantly, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so trying to, you know, that anticipation of the opportunities that are there for you tomorrow is something that you might be giving giving up by just focusing too much on the past and just learning, learning those lessons from, you know, what you could have done differently so that you don't repeat it. And sometimes it's okay. You know, failure is part of learning and growing. Uh, and I think in, on one of your podcasts, uh, I think we talked about um, WD-40. And one of the reasons it was WD-40 is because the first 39 failed. And so That's why right. is it called WD-40? And so, you know, there are so many other corporations that have gone through similar failures. And, you know, they don't focus on that. They, they focus on what the final result is that came out of those failures. 
And that is a great attitude to bring to what you would like to do in your next position, which is working with senior leadership and member engagement. And of course, being in a more senior position, so you could really influence the implementation and development of strategy in service of a mission. So tell us a little bit more about that, like about what kind of position you would really like to find next. Well, one of the things I enjoy about, you know, member engagement, membership in general is working directly with the membership. You know, I worked with boards, I worked with committees, and I think by sitting in a room with with your members is when you really learn what, what you know what their pain points are. What is it that keeps them up at night? What are what is it we as a trade association can can do to help them not worry about some of those things? And I think we're fortunate as an association that we represent such you know so many varied industries. Whether it's airspace, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's dairy farmers that you're actually getting an opportunity to talk to the members and see the impact that you're making on them at the end of the day. And I think that, you know, so many associations are celebrating 100 years, 50 years, 90 years, you know, and one of the reasons associations have been around is because of that unique opportunity we provide to our membership. It's that one-on-one relationship that you're building. You know, the corporate structure is so different The association world is completely a very unique, uh, you know, uh, occupation in itself where we really get to work directly with individuals that we have an impact. We see the impact that we're making and we're not, you know, we, some organizations obviously are going to continue working in siloed environment, but I think associations in general that we really have the ability to work together, even if you don't agree, but knowing that you're doing something for the greater good of your membership is really the key. And that's kind of what I'm looking for is I want to be able to work directly with members. You know, being a service organization is something that's really critical to me. Working with boards um, and committees because it's the committee structure where you really set the tone for the rest of the the membership, right? And so having a smaller, unique group um, that are, you know, talented individuals in their in individual areas is what helps you develop strategy organizationally. And I also love working with the leadership uh, and to set the organization, um, you know, precedents and making sure we're doing everything we can on behalf of our members. Well, let's talk about what type of organization then. I think that's an excellent summary of how you believe you can contribute to an organization's success. And it is all the relationships, as you said, uh, we are the relationship industry or relationship profession. I know some people don't like to call it an industry, but uh, we do. That is really what we do is, is work with people, connect them, help them succeed, which you have done very well in a number of positions. So what type of an association or other type of nonprofit organization would you really like to work at? And what I mean by that, do you mean like a professional society or a trade association or maybe even a foundation? Um, I would say more focused on the trade association. Um, you know, one of the challenges, I think, um, you talk to the, this new generation, whether it's Gen Z or millennials, and they basically say, you know, this is this is what my grandfather belonged to. But I think that is a very short-sightedness and, and it's not everybody. Uh, and one of the challenges of a membership organization is that you're, you know, you're working with the lawmakers, you're working with Capitol Hill, you're working with other government, you know, relations individuals from other organizations. So sometimes collectively, you're kind of trying to figure out what, you know, what is it that we can do to make sure that our members, you know, continue to strive that 100 years from now, that we're still going to be around, you know, it's, very few associations have celebrated 200 years. Uh, there might be, I could be wrong, um, but I'd say probably a trade association. I think that's where I feel I can have the biggest impact. Um, for, I mean, pers- professional societies are are great as well, but I like working in that, you know, for the greater good of a larger, um, larger, larger organization. So you're looking for a trade association that represents an industry and perhaps helping leadership set that example through industry standards and a code of conduct. Best practices, um, you know, that's that's another 
big thing that right now, especially best practices, given everything that we, we, we've heard and seen over the last, uh, you know, five, six years of organizations that are not, you know, fulfilling their uh, obligations by, you know, best practices, whether it's um, for their membership or whether it's even for staff, which, you know, that we see a lot of that as well recently. Oh, well, let, let me uh, explore that topic of best practices with you for a minute then. Uh, my One of my favorite quotes is from Humanized by Jamie Nodder and Maddie Grant was their first book. And the quote is, is it a best practice or is it just what everyone else is doing? And I think that's the fine line we all walk. So in your viewpoint, your experience, your opinion, how do you define a best practice? Well, I think, you know, every everybody, when they start a job, right, they bring a unique skill set to the role. And mm -hmm. we've all dealt with where you walked in, you know, you walked in the door and you want to change things. And one of the first things you hear is, well, that's how we've always done it. And so I think for them, it's probably best practices because they've always done it that way. But then what you're bringing to the table is, you know, something new. And so it, it it's... I think some of it, it's just knowing that, yes, you've done it this way before, but the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And whether it's using new technology, whether it's using new apps, whether it's using AI, that there are other things going on out there that people are changing, whether you like it or not. Technology is changing, whether you like it or not. And so you have to stay current with what's going on. And I, I see what you meant about trying to distinguish between the two. But again, it's that not doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Yeah. And, it, you know, try and true. Sometimes it's not always going to work. And a lot of times it depends. It's also depend on your membership, depending on who your members are, what industry you're you're working with. And there are people that are willing to accept those changes and there are industries that are not. And I think sometimes you kind of have to either try to find that happy medium, because at the end of the day, you're representing your members. And if they don't want a drastic change, then you have to figure out, you know, where can you meet in the middle and take those gradual, you know, one step or two steps rather than making that, that huge leap. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you view best practices as adaptability, flexibility, and constantly scanning the environment. Would that be a fair summary? I, I, I scanning the environment is such a, you know, it's part of the CAE you know, that's one of the first things you learn is you scan your environment and kind of take a look whether the changes that you want to effectuate are something that will be accepted, you know, organizationally, will be accepted by your membership. And, you know, uh, guess you can do a survey, but a lot of times you have to get that buy-in um, within your own staff first, uh, and then with, you know, then the leadership. And then obviously then the next step is, you know, your membership, your board, your committees, who you rely on heavily to effectuate those changes. So would it be fair to say that your definition of best practices is what's best for that organization? It's not necessarily doing what everyone else is doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. That is, that is a great summary. So you're looking for a senior level position uh, where you work directly with members, preferably in a trade association, uh, is there any industry that you're more interested in others than others, or do you just like the trade association model? Well, I, you know, I've worked in various different associations. I've worked for dairy farmers. I've worked for producers, farmers. Uh, I, I'm sorry, um, processors. I've worked for in the restaurant industry. I've worked for the helicopter association. You know, and so I think every new opportunity is an opportunity to learn new things. So you know, it, every industry has its challenges, but also every industry, you know, it gives you an opportunity to learn a new skill set that you may not have learned in your previous role. So uh, at this point, I think, uh, you know, the more I can learn, uh, the better. And, you know, that old adage, you're never too old to learn new tricks. Um, I think it's true for, for everybody, no matter, you know, no matter what industry you're in, no matter where you start, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's where you end up and what are the things that you learn along the way. That's, that's really important. Well, that's a great summary of what you're looking for and where you hope to land next. Uh, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you if they would like to follow up with you about opportunities? 
Absolutely. Uh, my email address is anujam2015 at gmail.com. Great. And you're on LinkedIn. I know that because we're connected there. So take the opportunity, everyone, to look up Anuja Minor on LinkedIn and learn more about her background. And you better hurry and contact her before someone else adds her to their team. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Nonprofit Executive Spotlight. And we'll be back next time, unless everybody gets a job. <laughs>